right. Look at this wonderful time. Look at this wonderful time. That does not look exactly like I wanted it to look. I'm going to be honest. If you look at that title, it's popping up right there. Not what I want it to look like. It'll look like... Look at that. That's not good. We're going to turn that off right now. Again, I am Lorenzo Serna. I am your host. You are live with Lorenzo. We have a little bit of a kind of like special episode, I'd say. Let me get rid of my name. It's just really bothering me. Bothering me. Anyways, um, a little bit of a special short episode. I thought it was still important to come live really quick and talk about some breaking news stuff. I don't know. I like talking about news. But tonight we also are going to have a guest. We're going to have an interview, but it's not going to happen until 7.30. So if you're here right now expecting an interview, it's going to be an hour and a half from now. Uh, we're going to start with a bit of a conversation on breaking news, trending topics, uh, basically everything that you know is kind of going on. And again, always a, a big thank you to the, well, the Red Seeds for letting me use this music and also uh, the Sparkle Club for, I guess, supporting this platform. Wow, look at that every time. And so you can join the Sparkle Club by going to patreon.com forward slash Lorenzo Serna. Lorenzo Serna. I made that bigger because I liked it bigger. Anyways, you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. Really exciting stuff. I have titles for all of those. Boom. So if you want to check that out, you can go there. We're going to be expanding the platform in a little bit. Pretty excited. We have a, a few more weeks of, of a run here. I think that we are almost done with this show's first season. What's it called? The pilot season. Let's call it the pilot season. Um, which, you know, some of you stuck around for. Maybe you checked it out. But, oh right, we're gonna get to this show before our, our guests tonight. Again, I really implore you to, to join us at 7.30. And if you can't, just go to the feeds. Uh, they'll be saved there. You can go back and watch any of these episodes. They are free to watch. Um, yeah, we're not sponsored by nobody, but I guess our patrons. So thanks again to the Sparkle Club. We're going to lower the volume. We're going to start talking about some newsy stuff. Well, everybody, I hate to say it, but we're going to start where we always kind of start. Hey, what's up, Susie Q? Thanks for being here. Uh, we are going to go to the COVID-19 dashboard. Boom, depressing stuff. We're going to go look at the depressing things. I think, there we go. All right, so we've been starting here, I think, for two, almost two months now, right? I don't know if you folks have been coming along. I'm going to turn my volume down on my phone. I apologize for that. I'm getting owned here. Um, yeah, so we've started here for a bit, right? We've looked at this, I think, every sort of beginning of the show. We look at the COVID-19 dashboard at John Hopkins, you know? So if you want to hate on whoever you want to hate, they're the ones gathering the data. Get to it. But we're going to go with this data uh, so yeah, so we know we've looked at this a few times. We're at 1,549,052 confirmed cases in the United States of America. What's up, Paragon? Thanks for joining for those waves on Twitch there. And so we're going to click on this. Yeah, well, this, yeah, we were already getting hit. Again, these are the statistics we are using. Some people don't like them. Uh, so they're saying 93,214 people have died thus far from COVID-19. Again, the statistics... When you get sick, and I think this is something people aren't understanding, like, um, so if you get cancer, you don't die from cancer, you die from something else, right? Because your, your immune system gets impacted, your health gets impacted already, and then you catch other things that eventually end your life, right? And so a lot of what I think people are hearing about the COVID-19, the statistics being wrong and not wrong, is the fact that people had other things that was going on with their lives, and then they caught COVID-19, and then their immune system, which was impacted by what was going on in their lives, which a lot of people in this country have things going on in their lives, lose their life, right? But they lost their life, yeah, maybe they had something beforehand, but now this added thing on top of it, their body wasn't able to fend it off because of what they had before, and so you can argue that whatever you want, but in the end, uh, I, you know, just so you know, when people pass away, usually what they pass away isn't the big thing. Okay. Anyway, so we're going to keep going here. Uh, so yeah, so that, that's what's going on here. So uh, on that statistic, we're going to keep going and look at a few stories and let's see if I can find what I was looking for here. So yeah, so again... That's sort of the numbers we've been using. Oh, yeah, the other thing we look at, and I, I should look at it again really quick here, is I'll move myself out of the way, is uh, the daily caseload. So the daily caseload is going down, right? So that's at least on these statistics, which, again, people don't feel great about. Some don't, some do. 
Uh, these are the daily. Oh, I think I just added some more. And this is worldwide. Oh, why won't you work? Anyways, I was just looking at this. It's kind of like occasionally works, occasionally doesn't, I guess. But the daily cases from what I was seeing in the United States, which isn't showing it to me right now, which I apologize, uh, has gone down, right? So the caseload, the amount of uh, positive cases have been going down in the United States. This isn't showing that data. And so that's kind of what a lot of people have been responding to and opening up the country, saying that, hey, it's cool to open up now. Uh, the caseload is slowing down. But again, if you looked at... um. If you looked at, uh, if you the, looked at, whoa, where'd that come from? Uh, if you the, looked at, whoa, where'd that come from? Uh, if you the, looked at, whoa, where'd that come from? All right, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So yeah, you saw that uh, there, there, all the statistics that the CDC was trying to put out to allow states or give states a roadmap to open it up did not, uh, not open it up. You know, there's no roadmap, really. That's pretty much what everyone's been saying. Is that there's just kind of open it up and we'll see how it goes. And so that's kind of where we're at. Um, we talk about data a lot. And so we're going to go ahead and look at more data stuff. Um, this is a kind of recent story. Uh, we talked about, like, the importance of data the other day. And so a woman who designed Florida's COVID-19 dashboard has been removed from her position. And so this is in Florida. Again, Florida is expected to have a spike uh, of this uh, virus. And as Florida starts to reopen, the architect and manager of Florida's COVID-19 dashboard announced she'd be removed from her position, Florida Today reported. And so it sounds like Rebecca Jones uh, said in an email, CBS 12 News, that her removal was not voluntary and that she was removed from her position because she was ordered to censor some data but refused to manually change the data to drum up support for the plan to reopen. Uh, yeah, so Jones made an announcement May 5th in a farewell email to researchers and other members of public who had signed up to receive updates on the data portal. So basically that sounds like they asked her to take on down some data and she said no, and then they sort of got rid of her. Uh, the data that she was asked to take down too was the, so it's, it sounds like, I was reading this, see if I can find it. Basically, um, some reporters asked her for the information on how many people were, were positive before um, it was being reported to the state's like dashboard you can see this dashboard here and they didn't want her to give that information and to get rid of it she reasons beyond like so signed up to receive updates she said that for reasons beyond like just code was no longer managing the dashboard anyways yeah so they didn't want those numbers on that dashboard anymore and so she was basically fired so there you go i don't know that happened again if this is real or not that happened you know just kind of talking about what happened Another thing, too, I thought was worth looking at um, and sort of like uh, weirdly kind of we talked about the military a little bit. Uh, we talked about um, the the aircraft carrier that has a bunch of tested positive. Those out of Guam people retested um, and were tested positive again. Uh, and there's a story on that, too, that the people who are retesting positive are, are ace, aren't able to spread it. So we'll get to that story as well. I know that was kind of like scary info, uh, but let's see here. So the federal, the National Guard's been deployed this whole time. Again, uh, the United States of America loves the military, <laughs> loves it, number one, number one. Uh, but it looks like the deployment, this is a day ago too, we're looking at the Military Times, if you want to know where, where uh, this is coming from, I read the Military Times. Um, tens of thousands of National Guard troops responding to the coronavirus pandemic could see their deployments halted one day short of qualifying for a host of veterans' benefits, according to a new report from Political Release Tuesday. So there you go. Uh, basically, the newspaper said federal officials in an interagency call last week acknowledged that the Guard deployments are scheduled to stop on June 24th, one day short of the 90 days needed to qualify for certain retirement and GI Bill benefits. More than 40,000 Guard members are currently serving under their Title 32 orders. That's the orders that um, initiated them to, to support the COVID-19 uh, response. The largest domestic employment of the force since... Hurricane Detrita's disasters in 2005. We'll see if that changes, but just so you know, like right now, there are, um, yeah, they're, they're gonna, literally they deployed these folks and they're going to stop their, their deployment one day before they can get more benefits and more pay and so on and so forth. Again, just what's going on. I don't know what to tell you. Um, along that vein, as the, the administration is, um, you know, doing what it does, this, eh, uh, should we look here? Well, this story is very, pretty slanted. 
Let's see here. It's a raw story. Basically, they definitely are saying that Trump is corrupt, but they are saying that Trump's corrupt, blah, 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 blah. Where is it? Basically, okay, what happened is that in a move that watchdog groups decried as an effort to reward big corporations at the expense of the public health and safety, President Donald Trump on Tuesday signed an executive order directing the heads of every federal agency to waive agency to waive, suspend, and eliminate all regulations that they could consider unnecessary obstacles to obtain recovery from the coronavirus crisis. Right. So that's what they're doing. Uh, I don't know how that's going to play out. It sounds like um, basically the administration put an executive order to try to eliminate regulations that could impede um, yeah, economic uh, revival or whatever they hope happens. Uh, and, you know... I don't really know. I mean, that can mean anything. Uh, we talked about, I think, earlier in a different episode about um, just, like, the law and, like, how vague laws are usually worse than, like, specific laws for the people, at least, you know? Like, usually the people in power want vague laws so they can sort of, like, use the unbound power to do what they want. People who aren't in power probably want really specifics so they know how the law will be applied to them as human beings. This does not seem very specific. Um, it sounds like a sort of like a, a, a blank pen and it sounds like they want to eliminate these regulations and just keep them eliminated forever. And we want to leave it that way, Trump said. Uh, I think it's interesting, of course, we in the United States have these fights around different pipelines. Uh, to me, this seems to like say, hey, like uh, for the economy, we're going to you know, get these pipelines built. We're going to do all this stuff really fast for the economy. And then, you know, he did say, uh, Trump did say, you know, speak to his head of env the environment. I can't remember who he is, uh, but also we've seen that not a lot of environmental sort of like bastion from this administration. So that's going on too. We'll see how that plays out. Um, yeah. How's it say this one too is pretty fun? I don't really know how I feel about that. I just think that that's going to like end up being maybe bad. You know, I mean, it's going to be what it is. But people are definitely going to use that for their advantage and a bunch of regulations that, you know, regulations are regulations. You can hate them, not hate them, but they do usually protect people. And usually they protect people who don't have a lot of power, right? So, like, people who don't have a lot of power can be like, hey, don't build your power plant into my water supply because, and they're like, oh, well, you don't, but then luckily these laws are like, hey, you shouldn't poison humans. Anyways. So, yeah, uh, hundreds of, uh, along the same lines, Let's just keep going here. We'll just keep going. And again, I'm just doing this really quick. I thought I, I promised my patrons that I'd be live Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So we're doing it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 6 p.m. Although I do have an interview tonight at 7.30. So I hope folks can stick around for that or come back or just watch it whenever you do. It'll be great. So again, like as uh, this pandemic unfolds, uh, workers are also organizing, uh, trying to get themselves some sort of protections, uh, more hazard pay. Hazard pay is being like stripped away right now. So even though like, the, there's still outbreaks going on and, and so on. People are you know, losing their hazard pay and this is sort of going back to work, are being told to go back to work. Uh, hundreds of McDonald's and workers planned this Wednesday right now to go on strike over COVID-19 protections. Uh, yeah, I am interested in this because I think, well, I'm always interested when workers are trying to organize, but also, you know, um, when this all started, and I don't know how many people remember this, uh, the president of the United States, Donald Trump, brought out the CEO of McDonald's. I think it was like CEO of McDonald's, Burger King. I should have just, you know, and just carded them in front and we're like, hey, these people are going to save you and make sure you get the food you need. These people. And, you know, that's never been true, right? The people who are getting the food you need are the, the workers who are actually making the burgers or, you know, whatever food's there and supplying that to the people. It has nothing to really do with that person. It has everything to do with every worker who's there actually doing the work. And so, yeah, there looks like they're, they're going to be Labor organizers say there has been scores of McDonald's workers with COVID-19 in at least 17 states. They also cite a survey of more than 800 McDonald's workers from March 31st, April 6th, in which 42% reported being told not to wear masks and gloves by management. The survey also said 46% came to work feeling sick because they were afraid they would be disciplined or penalized. Again, this is really Amer America right here, right? The survey also said 46% came to work feeling sick because they were afraid they were going to be would be disciplined or penalized because there isn't sick leave, mostly for you know, a, the job that's very not respected in this country at all. You know, a service worker job, a uh, fast food job. People aren't super, isn't like it's well supported. And yeah, they're, they're essential workers too. Like, so like the other thing about that, 
when I say that, is that these workers who aren't making $15 an hour in most places, right? They're making, who knows, not that much. We're essential workers. They, they are essential workers. They were literally dubbed that, still go to work, feed the people through the drive throughs uh, They kept working. So there you go. So we're going to keep keep it rocking here. But yeah, so we'll, we'll watch that. You know, there's, there's strikes, there's organizing going on. I know Amazon has been, uh, Amazon workers have been organizing. A lot of workers are organizing, trying to just get better situation for themselves. And a lot of these workplaces where you're seeing these can, like sickness, there's like workplaces where people are smashed together working very closely, and so on. Uh, I thought this was good news. So, I mean, that, that's kind of cool. I'm kind of flying a little bit today, but again, I want to make sure I'm, I'm really ready for this this interview tonight. But uh, the COVID-19 patients testing positive for second infection, not contagious, study shows. So, uh, we had talked about that that ship where people were testing positive for a second time, and it was, like, pretty, you know, clear-cut that they were being tested. Was there quarantined off the ship for two weeks, then brought back in, then tested, then sent off, brought back in, tested, then brought into the ship, and then later on tested, and they were positive again. You know, And they're like, how did that happen? You already had this. But it's turning out researchers in Korea have found evidence that patients who test positive for COVID-19 a second time aren't capable of infecting others and may have neutralizing antibodies to protect them from getting sick again. There you go. That's pretty cool. They may, it's all May. That's the other thing too. Like nobody knows anything about this this virus, right? So, uh, they're all we're all everyone's learning this stuff together at a various speed of like disinformation, lies, disinformation, little bit of truth, more disinformation, this political push for notoriety. You know, it's just like it's just madness. And so we're learning all this stuff right now. And this is something that we seem to be learning, which I think is good. So I hope that's true. Seems to be true. Uh, I mean, again, like I've seen this story a few times now. This isn't the first time I saw it, and I kind of ignored it for a few days. But now, like, I, I, I saw the story when it was like abroad, and I was like, well, we'll see how it goes. And it just seems to be catching on. So that's good. Uh, oh, I was going to bring it. So, also talking about um, responses, right? Here is uh, up in Canada, it sounds like the Mohawk Nation, Kanaste Mohawks block entrance to Oka provincial park so grand chief sergey simon fears second wave of covid19 as province re reopens parks and businesses i don't know how kanistaki mohawk set up checkpoints at the entrance of the oka province wednesday as the park was due to reopen stopping cars as they arrived and asking their op occupants to turn around and leave and so again um we found out like we've watched the covid19 pandemic and big cities, right? We've, we've been inundated with big city news. Like it's first like Washington and LA and then New York City. And so like what sort of I'm reading is now that, that that's sort of like run its course, the rural America now is going to be experiencing the pandemic. And the worry there, and it's something that we've seen sort of in like when talking about the Navajo Nation, um, you know, there isn't hospital beds. There isn't as much medical care. Like here in Minnesota where I'm at, uh, when this pandemic first started, people were like, don't come to the lakes, right? Like, stop coming to your lake property because when you leave the city, you're going to go to the rural area and our medical place is a clinic that has one ICU bed. And, you know, if we have any sort of run on that, it's going to be really bad, right? Like, you're not going to have the infrastructure there. And so that's a worry on, on indigenous nations, right? Which are really under, you know, supported. They're, they're just really impoverished. You know, the trees have just didn't really go through as good as they should have, or just were ignored by the States as Canada. And like, yeah, so they don't, they don't want, they want to control who's going in and monitor who's going in because if there's an outbreak in an area where there is like two, like in, in the Cheyenne River Sea Tribe, there's eight hospital beds, right? Like, what are you going to do? You know, it's not, it's not, it's not the same situation as New York or Florida or wherever, where they're pulling in all these resources, to try to like brudgeon up the response. And, I, and yeah, so, so, and, and here they took it into their own hands and they said the government had failed the Kinestaki Grand Chief Sergio Atsi Simon said the provincial government had failed in its constitution, du constitutional duty to consult with First Nations before reopening its parks network. Oka Park, about 60 kilometers northwest of Montreal, is adjacent to the town of Oka in the Mohawk community. So, yeah, so, again, 
you know, he says, we're seeing progress, infection rates, and death rates are starting to slow down. Uh, so it's really time to get the economy. Uh, so is it really a time to get the economy going? Anyway, so that's kind of like the arguments that are going on. And also in these smaller communities, those arguments are different. You know, they're going to be different. Most of them, they start experiencing. And again, we're in the indigenous, indigenous community here, but we start, they start experiencing that in like a... Anyways, it's going to be a different experience. And also, you know... It's one. It's just. Ugh. I want to turn that off. All right. So, I'm talking about just like you know, indigenous experiences or whatever. Um. We're talking about the Cyan Sea Tribe as well, right? And, and also like the Pine Ridge. Like the Pine Ridge Cyan Sea Tribe. They've set up their own blockades on their territories, saying that nobody can come because they or they that. You know, they're still letting the social workers through. We watched a video, I think, last Wednesday, you know, where the, a group there, a media group on the Cheyenne River Sea Tribe was just showing a, an exit. They live streamed an exit, too, for like uh, three hours, one of these blockades, showing the essential services going through and just saying who they're turning around as people who are just driving through to get to the other side. But people who are like live there or have supplies there, they're still letting them through. Um, the governor of South Dakota... I can see how this goes. I always hate using Facebook, but this is what they have said about it. This is an hour ago, or two hours ago. The thing that I wanted to touch on today is a brief update on the situation with the tribal checkpoints. Uh, despite weeks of uh, attempts to start a conversation and to find a solution between me, uh, Secretary Flute, and many others to resolve this matter informally, uh, finding a solution that would respect tribal sovereignty, also state sovereignty and federal law. Uh, the tribes have continued to maintain these checkpoints on U.S. and state highways. So as you all remember, on May 8th, I sent a letter to the tribes, to Cheyenne River and to the Oglala Sioux, uh, talking and asking and telling them to remove these checkpoints to be in compliance with the law. Uh, following the refusal of Cheyenne River to remove those checkpoints, I asked the South Dakota Attorney General to order an investigation into these checkpoints. Uh, and that investigation, while it's still ongoing, has produced both affidavits and video recordings of these unlawful checkpoints that are in place. Today, I provided all of that material to the White House, to the Department of Justice, the Department of Interior, the congressional delegation, Senator Thune, Senator Rounds, Congressman Johnson, asking for their assistance in resolving this situation. In addition to all the conversations that we've had already, um, I put forward a suggested compromise about a week ago on May 14th, uh, and I continue to work in good faith to help the tribes protect their people as well as comply with How law and to be good partners with the state of South Dakota. I know that there... Anyway, so like that's going on. I just figured I'd share that. So the state of South Dakota now has asked for support from the federal government to deal or to... What was the words they used? Well, to get the checkpoints open, right? They don't, they don't believe that the tribal governments have the right to run their own checkpoints and they're doing their best to dismantle them. And so that's sort of the latest news I think that's happened is that they're now planning to... Yeah. See what happens with that, because, you know, we're going to have to wait to see what the response actually is. But they have sent for help uh, to, and, and again, the Cheyenne River Sea Tribe, the, the Harmony Sea Tribe, uh, they, they're monitoring their own border uh, to see who's coming and going because they don't have a giant medical infrastructure. It isn't the same place as wherever you're at, you know, like they just don't. And so an outbreak in those situations where people are living in multi-generational homes, uh, very underhoused in some situations... Um, the I, the idea of an outbreak that, that could be devastating is, is it's not it's just a reality right it could just be a reality and so they're very concerned and they're operating the way they feel they should be operating in order to do that and that is by just not allowing someone to come frolic through their territories right now and if you know they're allowing oil and gas tankers to go through to the gas stations medical workers ranchers who own land they can still go to their land it's on the reservation it's just basically somebody who's trying to drive through there to get to the other side to take a shortcut they're like hey like we don't live here right now we don't want people going through this area so yeah yeah real party yeah i don't really know what the outcome of it will be 
All right, so we're, we're getting close to the end. Again, I just wanted to do this uh, really quick. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to be live every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 6 p.m. Central till the end of the month, and we're going to change times. The whole format probably will change. Um, so this is where we're at right now. And I have a guest tonight, but they're going to be on at 7.30, so I decided to still come on at 6. Hope I'm not super tired for them. I'll be really, really sad if that's what happens. The you know I just overexert myself. Uh, Midwest flooding. Okay, so this is a little. We're gonna move away from COVID nineteen stuff. Although COVID nineteen stuff now the pandemic's happening and we're having a disaster. So Michigan floods evacuations after Eden and Sanford dams breach. This is insane. I don't know if you saw this happen. Everyone's been watching this happen, but about. 10,000 residents have been evacuated in the U.S. state of Michigan after two dams breached following days of heavy rain, officials say. The National Weather Service issued a flash flood, flood warning emergency, flash flood emergency for areas around near Titabawasi River after the Edendell and Sanford dams failed. So these dams failed. One of them has been uh, basically at risk of failing since 2018, I guess. If you ever look at the rating of the United States infrastructure, it is low. Um, so this, this happened. So the second time in 24 hours, um, this is, so governor Gretchen Whitmer, who, you know, if you've been watching what's going on there, lots of intense stuff, declared a state of emergency for Midland County and mid Michigan on Tuesday. And said the city of Midland, a population of more than 40,000 could see a historic high water level. This is unlikely anything we've seen in Midland County. Ms. Whitmer said as a news conference. News at the a news conference, and to go through this during the pandemic is almost unthinkable. Now I, just, I mean, I've been talking about flooding going to happen. I didn't know the dams are going to break. Um, if you've been following the center of the country, there's probably more flooding, and there's going to be more people having to experience displacement at massive scale uh, due to just climate change. I don't know how to tell you. There's more water. More water is falling from the sky. And yeah, causing this stuff. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I would keep watching that. It's also kind of really worrisome when floods like this happen, right? So humans, here we are. Uh, we've created all of these systems to let us have society. You know, one of those is like we like to like go put all the garbage together in one place and like put it in a pile and let it be there. So when floods happen, usually... They sweep through and they pick up all our garbage, you know, and the water's usually really messed up. And so there's like a, a worry of that going on right now and specifically around Dow Chemical, I think it is. And so yeah, as the water is flooding through, catastrophic flooding triggered by dam failures in Michigan could potentially release toxic pollution from a site contaminated by the industrial giant Dow Chemical. Dallas facility in Midland, Michigan, where the company is headquarters along the Titabawasi River, manufactured chlorine-based products beginning in the early 1900s. Uh, say that the pop of the pollution built up in the sediment in along the river and its floodplains extending 50 miles downstream through the Senegal River. Sag. Sag Bay. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Superfund program was has been overseeing Dow's cleanup of the site since 2012, and the last portion of the project was expected to be completed in 2021. And then this happened. In a three-mile stretch of contamination close to the mainland plant, Dow removed some sediment and placed a cap over the sediment. Anyway, so yeah, and you know, tailings ponds. I almost want to go back to some tailings ponds, but you know, when 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 humans do mining, they create a bunch of wastewater and they put it in like little piles and surround it with stuff. And they're like, oh, we're going to keep it here. And then it's going to like evaporate and then won't poison, poison us. You know, that's the thought process. Look it up. It's in their little books. Um, yeah. So that's always a worry, right? So when we have these giant floods, they're going to crawl across. You know, there's always like a worry of sewage and flooding too, right? Like you know, when the, the flood waters are always like, don't drink them because there's, you know, they're, your sewage systems are inundated, you know, but also it's like the landfill is going to be inundated the the super fun site's going to be inundated and there's things that people have to worry about so we'll keep following that i i saw it was like in midland midland it was gonna be like nine feet of water from the flood there's like two dams like two dams are completely destroyed that's wild so you can see here's here's where the dams are at here's where midland's at so it's holding back this lake and yeah 
It's pretty horrifying. You're saying seven feet, several feet. All right, so we're going to go from there. But yeah, let's keep following that. Everybody who's in that area, I, I hope everything is as good as it can be. It, uh, hey, thanks for joining, Buck. It's uh, I've been in some floods. I can tell you it's it sucks. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna keep part in a little more before we go. I want to take us back to Brazil. We talked about Brazil last week, Monday. I think it was Monday. I talked to you last thing I said was like Brazil was gonna is like a hot spot and like their presidents like doing push ups and like jet skiing and not treating it like a big deal. And so two landmarks in the last forty eight hours. This is Derek Thompson on Twitter. Italy, which one month ago had 5x more daily COVID cases per capita, the global average fell. Yay. And Brazil, which one month ago had 90% fewer daily per cases per capita than the U.S. or U.K., surpassed both. So there you go. And this is the the case line. Look at the U.S. Like, oh, 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 oh. So Brazil's, Brazil's going up. Um, yeah. I don't know what to tell you. It's really scary. Uh, the favelas already don't have a lot of food, don't have a lot of water. Uh, it's like this really uh, sort of a really close, compact area of very impoverished people who are like living. And they've been protesting a lot in Brazil, trying to bring attention to their, their situation and the fact that the like, COVID-19 like, people are dying uh, in large numbers in Brazil right now. I, I don't think I have the accurate numbers, but they're, they're, they are. And so people are, are, are worried about what's going to happen in Brazil Mostly because, again, the, the president hasn't been super taking it seriously. Although he did, and just to give you an idea of how lockstep uh, Bolsonaro and Trump are, is that Brazil's Bolsonaro expands the use of controversial hydrochloroquine after daily coronavirus deaths in country hit record high. So that's the response. So on the same day, Brazil's death though hit a record high of 1,779. Before Tuesday, the highest number of daily coronavirus was, uh, deaths was 881 on May 12th. Uh, according to the tracker we use, look at that. Yeah, they've, they're now saying they should use this stuff. See, Bar- B- 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 Bolsonaro, who has downplayed the coronavirus threat to his country, has insisted on reopening Brazil's economy. So the economy is going to open up. That's the other thing. Like we, I, I'm not spending time arguing that it's not, are we not, should you or shouldn't we? They are trying to open it up. And so what's going to happen then is what I'm worried about. I'm not like, you know, I think that People are going to die. I mean, if you want to hear what I think, yeah, people are they're literally just like selling away life for, for the hope of saving the economy. And yeah. And also, like we said, if they don't open up, people are also getting sick and dying. And so it's like the, the situation is bad, but the previous economy has no interest in protecting workers. Um, as we go back again, they're already taking away hazard pay. Um, the meat packing facilities are trying not to report how many COVID-19 cases they have. Uh, reports from meat packing places and again don't not get debate about how you feel about meat um just a real place people work is they're not providing them any, any special sort of like gear and yeah there's, there's outbreaks happening right and there's sort of this hoping they get through it um all right we're getting close to the end oh for also the along in the united states is they you know as we go back in here ford just closed down their facilities because of COVID-19, again, uh, another workplace where people are working next to each other. And again, we, we talked a lot about how this is spreading and what we're hearing a lot is just, you know, enclosed areas with people talking because it's, it spreads through droplets. And so when you're in enclosed areas uh, talking, you're probably going to catch it uh, if somebody has it there. Just days after reopening its American assembly plants, Ford temporarily shut down two separate factories because employees tested positive for COVID-19. And so that's like the prediction of the future, right? So the prediction of the future, from what I'm seeing, and I'm, I'm, I'm listening to uh, Holster, Osterman, I guess. Um, I was listening to his podcast today. He's putting one out. He's uh, at this, the center of the... There, hold on. Let me get... Uh, Osterholm. Osterholm. So Michael T. Osterholm, an American infectious disease epidemi- uh, epidemiologist, regents professor, and director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. That dude. Basically, he was saying that, like, uh, you know, like in Wuhan, one of the things he said today was that about 15% of people have been infected there. And so they're not even close to, to herd like, uh, uh, immunity, which everyone talks about. And so and he was saying that, like, you have to get to 60 to 70%. And so just imagine the amount of death that will happen to get there. 
And that's like what people are, are talking about. And he's also talking about um, that a lot of the tests that are being used, like some of them work good, some of them don't work good, some of them have to be used together with other tests. It's just sort of like they all have different like varieties of how well they work. And he was talking about how at the White House, when he had those positive cases of COVID-19 that turned up, and everyone was like, how did that happen? And his said was because they were using one specific test that occasionally would show that it was uh, would put out false negatives. And everyone knew that. And the way that it was remedied was to take that test along with a different test that made sure that didn't happen, and they weren't doing that there. And he was kind of saying, like, so let's imagine, like, everyone's saying testing, but is they, are they doing smart testing? Is this, like, a, really a thing that's working well when at the highest place they didn't, they didn't do testing right? He's like, this is the situation. Um, and he still believes, uh, well, this, uh, we're still at the beginning of this pandemic. Uh, I know some people don't believe it's real. Somebody up in my chat on Twitch was really upset that I was talking about it. Um, and yeah, well, I, like I said, this channel does uh, believe that the coronavirus is real and we are concerned about our relatives and we want to make sure the people we care, uh, we, we do what we can for them, you know? That's basically it. All right, I think that's it. Again, I, I just I just wanted to come on really quick. I'm gonna get ready for my interview at 7:30. I want to make sure that it goes pretty well. I'm really excited for it. Um, let's see if I can try to give you who I'm interviewing at seven here. So G Jacqueline Cepeda, Cepeda. Uh, Jacqueline is a non-binary Chicanx with indigenous roots from Tongva, Los Angeles, California, Ramui, Chihuahua, Mexico, and Guamaras, Guanajuato, Mexico, occupied lands. Uh, before the pandemic, their focus within Twin Cities was creating skilled chairs for people of color and doing support work for native communities and distributing. Hold on, you know what I'm going to do here? As we get back, we'll go back to this big screen. So we get, we're going to, you know, we're going to come back with this interview, and. Here I am, way bigger. Hey, everybody, thanks for being here. So again, just come back uh, at 7.30 p.m. Central. Uh, again, I'm doing my best to, to be live at 6 p.m. And today's a shorter sort of like run of stuff, and I kind of ran through it really quick. Uh, but that's because I'm getting ready for this interview tonight at 7.30. Um, it's just the best time to work for them. And something I told myself when I was working on this show was sort of like, oh, I want to have everything at 6. But then also, like, if I have the ability to interview somebody at a different time, I might as well do it. Because, I, I you know, like, they're... Their schedule is also like something I'm gonna have to work with, so I can't force everyone to be here at 6 p.m. with me. Um, I'm asking them to, and if they can't, I'll, I'll meet them later. You know, so today we're gonna meet them a little bit later, and I, we're gonna be talking to Jacqueline, uh, who, like I said, uh, they're, they're before the pandemic, their their focus in the Twin City was creating skill shares for people of color, doing support work uh, for Native communities, and distributing supplies for homeless populations. Uh, they currently have shifted their focus on working with BIPOC farmers to start and obtain plants to distribute to BIPOC communities with the intention to increase food security and access to growing food while we are social distancing. They're also in the National BIPOC Community Boosting Group that meets bi-weekly and is involved in facilitating Skillshare's online. A lot more to this, uh, to, to Jacqueline. I'm looking really forward to that conversation. Um, that's going to be in about an hour. I want to say thank you to everybody who was here for this short, short episode, episode 18. I might leave the 18 on for tonight. This counted as the same thing. And the reason I'm separating them is just that it's easier. So that way somebody wants to go and just see um, uh, the interview, they can go see it. And they don't have to watch the first me babble forever or whatever again uh th yeah well anyways uh that was that was the the episode i'm gonna play some music the outro music that i has so kindly been given to me by or let me use it by the red seeds again i'm lorenzo said i'm your host we are really quickly as coming on board to say hello and tell you a little bit of the news stories if you do want to support this channel, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Lorenzo Serna. Join the Sparkle Club there. Thank you to the Sparkle Club, as always, for making this possible. Again, you can follow me on Twitch. Good to see some Twitch viewers. Uh, I see some of them don't like what I'm doing. One of them does. One of them doesn't. All good. That is how the world works. Uh, thank you to folks watching on Facebook. And don't forget to hit like, follow, and share. Only way people are going to see this. Again, no budget for... For promotion uh, on Twitter as well. I'm going to Periscope right now. If you're watching there, thank you so much uh, for being here. I was thinking about taking my Periscope down. I don't think I'm going to do it. Change my mind. And then again on YouTube as well. YouTube.com forward slash Lawrence Lacerna. 
You can find me in all those places. Again, I am your your host. We are live with Lorenzo. This was May 20th, 2020. Episode 18. We're going to have an a, a addendum. Is that what it is? Our follow-up, an encore for the day? I don't know. But just join me in about 50 minutes, 7.30 p.m. Central. We'll be back here. And thanks again for being here for this first part of the show. Talk to you later. Bye.